Welcome to week four, which will focus on equity and ethical issues of diets and food systems. In the third module, we'll talk about science as well, ethical dilemmas in the science of food and nutrition. So let's get started. So what are the major inequities to healthy, sustainable diets and food systems? This is a framework that was just published by the Global Nutrition Report in 2020 showing you the social determinants of nutrition outcomes. So underlying determinants are things such as everyday circumstances and, and norms that people face, material circumstances, health and eating norms, behaviors and practices, and psychosocial factors. It's also that underlying uh, the everyday circumstances are the environments, the food environment, the care environment of children, the health environment, the living environment and where people live. These determinants can influence nutrition outcomes and highlight some of the inequities. Underlying the underlying determinants are the basic determinants. These are larger societal determinants, things like socioeconomic and political contexts, governance, institutions, fragility of countries, human capital, the education system, employment opportunities, economic opportunities and social opportunities, as well as social position, wealth, sociocultural perceptions of age, gender, ethnicity, and income. These basic and, under, and underlying determinants can determine fairness, justice, inclusion socially, and these all influence nutrition and health outcomes. So who is most affected by food security, food insecurity, and malnutrition? Who, who has the most devastating impacts on, on, of, of these two issues? Well, the poor, those who are poor, those who are living in poverty traps, the rural, and I would argue the urban poor, as we urbanize, more and more people are moving to urban centers that are ill-equipped to handle the population growth of these places. So there's a lot of lack of services in both rural and, and some urban places. The geographically isolated, which we'll come back to, women, girls, and children. Uh, biological needs at those stages of the life cycle, but also their place in some societies, lack of empowerment, lack of voice, lack of agency. The marginalized, the discriminated, can be based on ethnicity, tribe, uh, lots of, of factors that play into that, and those that live in conflict in fragile countries. Geography does matter. We see a lot of geographic inequities. The map on the left is showing you Baltimore City mapping out healthy food environments. The lighter, the pink, uh, is less healthy food environments. The darker red is healthier food environments. And you can see in Baltimore, there's many places where it's very hard to get access to healthy food outlets and environments. In the middle picture is a place where I work, work a lot. It's the Horn of Africa, East, uh, East Africa, Northeastern Kenya, particularly where pastoralists live, very susceptible to climate change, food and water insecurity and conflict, very geographically isolated in the region, very, very tough place to live. And on the right is Nepal after the earthquake in the mountains, which uh, essentially uh, cut off some communities. So geography matters in your ability to access food, to get food to these places. Uh, to get access to services and some of those other determinants that were highlighted in that framework around uh, your living environment and your ability to get services, healthcare, education, and of course, food. This is um, a, an interesting study done by Adam Drunowski at the University of Washington. 
and he maps out Seattle. On the far right map is showing you uh, property values of, of homes around Seattle. The green being higher income or higher property value of homes. And obviously that green hugs the beautiful waterways of Seattle. And on the left is showing you the healthy eating index with the green being healthier eating uh, and, and the red being less healthy. And you can see that these maps look quite similar. They overlay with each other quite, quite well. And it's showing you the correlation that property values, and they also looked at education and income, are associated with higher healthy eating index scores. So geography can matter. And we'll talk a bit more about how do we deal with food deserts and food swamps uh, in, in lectures uh, uh, six, in week six. So let's talk a little bit about access, particularly uh, economic access to food. Well, there's two essential laws in agriculture economics that are critically important to know. And one is called the Engels Law. As income increases, the demand for food products increases at a slower rate, meaning that as a household gets more income, they spend less of that income on food and have more disposable income to spend on other things. So you can see this orange coming down where the proportion spent on food as income grows is spent on other services, other commodities outside of the budget chair food. And you can see here in this graph showing you a comparison of countries looking at household expenditures and what's spent on food. U.S. spending very little of income on food, 6.5% of household income spent on food. Uh, obviously some of the other high income countries, UK, Canada, Germany, South Korea, Japan, France. But if you look at the bottom, you can see Nigeria, Cameroon, Pakistan spending 40, 50, 60% of their entire income on food, leaving much less to be spent on other goods and services. The other law is Bennett's law. As incomes increase, households reduce their food budget share of starchy staples and substitute more towards luxury foods, perishable foods, more expensive foods, fruits, vegetables, dairy, meat, uh, dessert, sugar, oils. So you see that people spend uh, less on food and if they do spend on food, they have a more diverse food basket. And you can see that graphically shown here. And this is a nice uh, picture on the right showing you that the extremely poor spend most of their income on their staple grain, in this case, rice. But as wealth increases, you see much more diversity of the food basket, uh, introducing perishable foods, animal source foods. And with that, risks of micronutrient deficiencies, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, starts to decline with that dietary diversity. This is a graph showing um, uh, data from the World Food Program looking at uh, the cost of the diets. And when we look at, uh, this is showing you uh, Asian countries, Cambodia, Pakistan, Laos, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka, it shows the percentage of households that cannot afford their basic cost of diet. The blue is the national household cost of diet on average. And the orange bars are showing you the households that meet are able to meet that cost of the diet. So look at Cambodia, only 20% of households can meet their basic cost of diet, which is quite incredible. Um, so you see this in many places around the world where people just cannot afford their basic nutritional needs. I showed this in week three. This is the Eat Lancet Costed Diet, and it showed that roughly 1.6 billion people cannot afford that diet. But this is looking at the data a little bit differently. It's showing you the cost of the Eat Lancet diet by country income levels in major regions. So high income to low income, um, you can see that the cost of that uh, Eat Lancet diet. And across countries, 
you can see uh, the different uh, impacts on, on the cost of, of the diet. Um, when you look at as a percentage of the gross national income per capita, it really shows some interesting data and that low income countries uh, uh, is a much higher percentage of the gross national income per capita and same in sub-Saharan Africa as compared to the other regions. So these places are more affected by the cost of the diet as a percentage of the GNI. And I showed this as well. Um, and this is to emphasize that the Eat Lancet diet was a plant-based diet. It was a flexitarian diet. When you introduce more animal source foods, you can imagine that cost of the diet being even more expensive. And again, you see in high income countries, different animal source foods are, are pretty cheap um, to, in some case, fish and seafood being the most expensive. Whereas in low and low middle income countries, these animal source foods, be it milk, white meat, eggs, fish, red meat, is very, very expensive for, for, these, for these countries. So there's a real inequity in the access, the economic and physical access to food in the world. But we have to keep in mind that it's not just physical and economic access. There's many other underlying social determinants that impact our health and nutrition status. Every country is impacted by poverty, but its determinants may be different depending on where you are, who you are, and the type of support that you can get. When we look um, at Baltimore, a place where Hopkins is, we see social determinants such as racial disparities, incarcerated, incarcerated affected families, gun violence, drug and alcohol abuse, food insecurity, obesity, and diabetes. And the city um, perpetuates, where people live, of course, perpetuates some of that, but there's a lot of underlying social determinants that are impacting some of these issues that we see. In another place where I work, East Timor or Timor-Leste, you see other social determinants, some overlapping with Baltimore, a high in, living in a high-income country, uh, um, and Timor being a lower to middle-income country. You see things like tribal disparities, very similar to racial disparities, social unrest and border conflict, uh, herb abuse, um, food and water insecurity, and stunting and wasting, and starting to see rising obesity. So it's really important to look at where you work, where you live, and think about those determinants that make it more difficult for people to live a healthy life. And there's a lot of inequities when we start to think about who gets access to what, who is able to, to fulfill the life that they want to live. Much of that being uh, the context of where they live, the country and political uh, determinants, as well as those social determinants. And the Global Nutrition Report uh, talked about how we need to tackle these social determinants that lead to inequities and injustice. There's many barriers that hold people back. We know that um, there's inequities within countries, within communities, within households that leave many people vulnerable. Diets are a big part of that. So is the health system. Uh, so is the nutritional care within health system. And they argue in the report that it's time to act and uh, we need coordination to build better sustainable food and health systems. We need to invest more in nutrition. We need to focus on joint efforts that look globally uh, to nationally. And we need to expand uh, commitments to nutrition and strength and accountability. This is outlined in the Global Nutrition Report this year, and I highly encourage you to read it. It's all about inequities and how do we tackle those. Welcome to Module 4.2. We're going to talk about the ethical implications of our diets and food systems on climate change and overall sustainable development. Let's get started. 
I really like this quote. This is from former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. In a world where one third of all edible food never makes it to the mouths of the hungry, we all have an individual moral responsibility to do our part. That really has ethical uh, teeth to it. She talks about moral responsibility. And many in the world feel that no one should go to bed hungry. We have a moral obligation to ensure that happens. Unfortunately, as you saw in week two, we still have 821 million people going to bed hungry. So let's talk about this moral obligation. Let's start first with one issue, rights, duties, and institutions. So one question you might ask is, is the right to food the right not to be poor? Most would say, yes. We have failed to end hunger using the traditional recipe that saw hunger as a technical problem, requiring only that we produce more. We failed because we've underestimated the need to empower people and hold governments accountable. That's by the former UN Rapporteur on the Right to Food, Olivier de Schutter. And this really comes from the work of Amartya Sen, who talked about power, poverty, and this food insecurity, people's capabilities. Do they have the capability to lift themselves out of poverty? Obviously, food and poverty are intricately tied. Uh, it is difficult to secure food if you're poor. If you're poor, it's, it's, it, you stay food insecure. So we really need to think about this right to food and, and what does it take to ensure that governments fulfill that right for their citizens. Uh, we wrote a paper a couple years ago now looking at, is there a right to adequate nutrition? And we argue yes, but it's often difficult because there's a lack of clarity outside the technical field of nutrition regarding what does nutrition actually mean? Uh, and it hasn't been very effective in fulfilling the right to nutrition because uh, of this lack of clarity, which I'll come back to. So whose duty is it to deal with hunger and malnutrition? Who should be responsible for ensuring that hunger and malnutrition disappears in the world? Well, the health sector is often the most burdened in addressing this issue. Um, but the other sector naturally to play a major role is the agriculture sector. Uh, but nutrition really is not included within traditional views of agriculture. So when we look at what agriculture has done, it's been incredibly efficient at producing global cereals, uh, staple calories, as population has grown. But shouldn't they do more? Shouldn't they go beyond just increasing aggregate food supply and think about supplying more healthy and nutritious food and safe food um, as opposed to just feeding people and keeping people alive. Why not have them thrive? That's a big question in the agriculture community um, and one that they should be taking up in, in a serious, significant way. Another big issue is food and nutrition projections and data. Is it transparent? Is it accurate? Well, given the importance of projections in public policy and their impact on the welfare of present and future generations, data and their projections should be based on transparent, ethically defensible assumptions, and they should be free of bias and unethical influence. But this isn't always the case. And we're going to come back to this in, in the third module when we talk about science. But there's a lot of assumptions in hunger and nutrition data that's unclear and ethically problematic because underlying that data, the empirical data can be weak and questionable. And there's been a lot of controversy around counting the hungry, the FAO projections around undernourishment or what's called the POU, the prevalence of undernourishment. There's a lot of controversy about those figures. Are they accurate? Who is it counting? What's the error bars in those numbers? And we often see also, this is an older figure, but um, this is showing uh, the 
Global Hunger Index, in which they call a countries winners and losers. Is that okay to be calling countries that? Is this a bit of a shame and blame type of game? Um, is that uh, acceptable to be using data in that way? There's also the issue of absence of fixed responsibilities because of too many actors and sectors. Nutrition is one of these issues that is often said it's everybody's business and no one's responsibility. It's not really in the health sector. It's not really in the agriculture sector. So what happens? It falls through the cracks. So who is responsible at the end of the day for ensuring adequate food and nutrition security? That's the big question. There is no sector of nutrition. In Malawi, for example, they had an office of nutrition in the prime minister's office. They elevated nutrition to the prime minister level, but you don't see that in many places. So nutrition is one of these areas that doesn't have a sector, so it, it, it doesn't have a responsibility. Nutrition also requires many different multiple sectors, different disciplines and institutions to come together. It needs coordinated multi-sectoral, multi-actor, multidisciplinary action. And that's what makes it so difficult to really pin down responsibility. And last, nutrition is not so visible. It's not like Ebola or HIV AIDS or malaria. So it's very hard to garner priority for nutrition. And this is um, a figure from Nick Nisbet and colleagues showing you the evolution of nutrition policy and politics and how it's really nutrition has moved. It was a very siloed, it was a reductionist kind of approach that focused on protein and then it went into micronutrients and then it became this very multi-sectoral type uh, environment which harks back to the way it was in the 1970s, failed attempts to address nutrition through a multi-sectoral approach. We're in that phase again, we have much more knowledge, we know what to do now, we know how to coordinate multi-sectorally, but um, there's still much more that we need to understand about nutrition. So nutrition is one of these places uh, and, and disciplines and sectors uh, that really da garners uh, the need for everyone's attention. And when everyone needs to attend to it, um, it becomes very difficult to, to target responsibility. The second set of ethical issues is the inequalities and discriminatory perceptions of nutrition and food. So who should be prioritized? Who is vulnerable and why? Why are they undervalued? Why are they vulnerable? Should women and adolescent girls be prioritized for food security and nutrition programs and policies? Or should everyone, everyone has nutritional needs throughout their life cycle, should we prioritize everybody? And when we start to prioritize, this leads to competition for scarce resources. So when we think about the cycle of malnutrition, this intergenerational cycle, child who's born of low birth weight, becomes a, a stunted child who becomes a stunted adolescent. She tends to, to uh, drop out of school, get married early, get pregnant early. She has a poor birth outcome and this cycle continues. So the question remains of where do you focus in this life cycle and where should the resources be, uh, be uh, allocated to and how do you break that cycle? This is a big debate in the nutrition world. You can think about the thousand days, conception to two years of age was a big focus in, in 2009, 2010, 2011. Now the focus is on adolescent girls. It's shifted. It, it traditionally was focused on pregnant women, not for women, but for better birth outcomes. Um, and we know that when we look at child malnutrition, very important to address malnutrition at that stage. Uh, we see a lot of inequities. I showed this uh, in week two, showing you these disparities between urban and rural, uh, rich and poor, higher education, lower education of parents. When we look at stunting, wasting, and overweight among children. 
So children are important to prioritize, but we also know that women are important to prioritize. Not only will women give birth to children who want those birth outcomes to be, to be positive, but women, for women's sake, is important as well. Women have certain nutritional needs throughout their life cycle, and special nutritional needs throughout the life cycle. And we know that women have higher burdens of malnutrition as compared to men. We know that uh, they suffer from more anemia, they suffer from more overweight and diabetes, and they suffer from more underweight as compared to men. And we wrote a paper uh, a year or two ago asking, who is the woman in women's nutrition? And thinking about the need to support women's nutrition, regardless if they have children or not, throughout their life. A third ethical issue is trade-offs and priorities. And this is really where the climate change debate and food systems comes into play. But before we get to that, one priority is in the nutrition space, is how do we prioritize nutrition in what setting and how do we align policies and programs? And a perfect example of this is those that work on humanitarian relief and nutrition and those who work on more longer term development. These worlds in nutrition are very different and they often do not meet. They do not organize together. They carry out very different sets of activities. So let's say when a disaster occurs, humanitarian actors come in, their immediate goal is to save lives, feed bellies, and ensure that no one dies. Well, those who work in longer term development ask, well, can we think about how to improve the quality of those programs in humanitarian settings? So the time scale, the types of activities, and the response approach in those two different environments can't be more different. And this is a graph or a table showing you those that work on acute crises, the type of malnutrition, acute malnutrition, think about a more medicalized treatment approach. They work with the Ministry of Health. They work with humanitarian organizations. They're providing ready-to-use therapeutic foods, food aid. Um, they have very different delivery models where they're looking at uh, cr uh, management of acute malnutrition pr type programs. Where those who work more on chronic issues, multifactorial type responses uh, to address longer term uh, cognitive impairments, reduced economic performance, more of the stunting type approach. They work on preventative multisectoral programs. They work with ministries of health. They work with ministries of agriculture, ministries of education. They think about uh, improving agriculture, improving uh, breastfeeding, improving fortification programs, and they work a lot with community-based long-term programs, social protection. These are very different worlds. How do we better align those worlds so we can uh, address both issues at the same time? It's a big issue. So how do those priorities work? And again, resources get allocated differently to those types of approaches. The other issue is how do we manage trade-offs and how do we decide what the priorities should be? When we think about the sustainable development goals, many of the goals, and I always focus on SDG2, which is zero hunger, this goal interacts with many other goals, both positively and negatively. You can imagine if you improve SDG3, good health and well-being, it will have positive impacts on SDG2 as well. But if we focus on economic growth, maybe it won't have as positive impacts on zero hunger. Some people may be left out of that, of that growth trajectory. And this was a paper looking at the interactions of SDG2 with the other SDGs. And you can see some positive impacts of, of SDG1, which is no poverty, SDG3, uh, SDG 5, which is gender equality, SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation, etc. But there's also some negative impacts of certain goals or certain targets within those SDGs.
that can have negative implications and trade-offs in achieving SDG2. So we have to be thinking about these relationships. The trade-offs of achieving one goal can have a negative or a positive implication on another goal. The fourth ethical issue is food choices and preferences. So we often think about the ethical obligations of or the limits on state interference with individual food choices. So what's the meaning and value of consumers' freedom of choice? We can think right now in the COVID situation as the United States begins to open up again, what's the freedom of choice? Should you wear a mask? Should you not? Uh, should you have the uh, choice to be able to choose that? There's many questions around this looking at public health and public health good. How should industry be governed in this context? Should they? Uh, why are there diminishing societal trust with, with industry? We'll talk a bit about that in, in the next module. But so when is it important to establish policies that may impact or regulate food choice um, and, and infringe on self-liberties and autonomy, or what they often call the, a paternal type situation, a paternal policy. Um, we've seen many examples of, of, of policies that have attempted to do this. We can think of soda taxes. We can think of Bloomberg's limiting soda size, uh, size in New York City, uh, which didn't succeed. It was considered too paternalistic. So when should uh, there be a government regulation that has, uh, that interferes with individual food choice? Well, one could be on uh, restricting or eliminating advertising of junk food to children. So children require special protection from harm and are particularly vulnerable from a dietary nutrition perspective. We know that food marketing uh, to children is exceptionally high. You can see here uh, the growth, um, the, the comparison of healthy food marketing to unhealthy food marketing. You see it all over. Here's an example of a cereal box that's targeting children, the colors, um, you know, the cap and crunch delights, the whole look of the package is influencing children. You can think about toys in packages. Happy Meals and McDonald's being the classic case. So in this case, there's ethical justification for protecting children because they have a special needs. They need special protection. They don't have voice. And, and we've seen some countries uh, regulate uh, advertising of junk food to children. So who should protect children? Um, this was a paper uh, by Harris and colleagues showing um, how food marketing contributes to childhood obesity and looking at the different forms of protection um, that take place, uh, school rules, school restrictions. Um, obviously, there's national or city county type restrictions, international rules like breast milk substitute code type situations, Codex Elementaris. Um, a lot of the self-regulation uh, country, uh, company promises um, uh, have not really been fulfilled. Um, so there is a, a case for uh, regulation of, of government um, to come in and, and try to restrict or eliminate uh, advertising and marketing of, of junk food to children. And the last, I just wanted to talk about this social justice if we take a social justice approach, and this is very much in the in John Rawls' uh, uh, school of social justice, in that all people share a common humanity, and therefore we have a right to equitable treatment, support of human rights, and a fair allocation of resources, I think we can argue that we need a social contract to ensure that everyone has a fair shot at fulfilling their best life. And a big part of that is ensuring that people have the right to food, not only in calories, but nutritionally rich food and nutrition care and services. If we think about the importance of food and nutrition in development, 
and social cohesion and all of the things we talked about in that first module of week one, we as a humanity, as global citizens, need to have a social contract with each other, ensure that everyone has a fair shot at the best uh, nutritional outcome so they can fulfill their life. So now we're on module 4.3. Where is food and nutrition science faltering? I wanted to talk about this because there's a lot of ethical implications about the nutrition and food science field that I think is important to highlight. So let's get started. So first, nutrition research and science has some inherently challenging issues. Here are three articles I just uh, posted for you that have been published this year talking about how challenging human nutrition research can be. Why is that? Well, when you think about the food you consume, you're taking in different types of foods, you have a dietary pattern, in those foods are nutrients and other health-promoting properties. And we want to understand what that food does to the human body. Does it promote human health? If so, how and which components of that food are important for human health? Or if you don't get enough of food or you consume certain foods, can it harm human health? Well, how do we do that when we are exposed to so many different things throughout the day? Well, you can put people in a room, feed them a certain diet and watch them over time and see what happens from a health perspective, what kind of health outcomes result. But we can't do that. People don't want to eat one food or one nutrient. Uh, and sit in a chamber for 20 years and have someone take a lot of metrics on them. So how do we deal with that? How do we deal with this conundrum that people live their lives, people eat lots of food, they're exposed to many things beyond food, um, and how do we better understand that? Taking dietary data is also equally challenging, that people self-report, they don't remember what they eat, they uh, fib a bit about what they eat because of the societal judgments put on people with the kind of foods that they eat. So the nutrition epidemiology field is riddled with many uncertainties, many disagreements about how to do human subjects type research and to better understand what is good or bad for you. And this leads to arguments and disagreements within the nutrition science field, but it also leaves the public health incredibly confused about what kind of diet should I eat that leads to better human, outcome, human health outcomes? There's also a lot of confusion of messages, many different world views or ideologies within the field that add to that confusion. And this is an example of looking at uh, how people perceive how to fix the food system. You often hear the food system is broken or it's failing us. And you can see these different narratives of, well, what, how is it broken? What is that failure? What's threatened or needs to be fixed? And what priorities do I take? You know, so there's those that say, well, we don't have enough food to feed the world. Let's focus on food security and let's increase food production. Then you have those that argue, well, we're producing enough food. It's just not healthy food. And we need to focus on nutrition and health. And we need to close the nutrient gap produce more healthy foods. Some would say, well, it's unethical or unequal or inequitable type of distribution of food. We need to focus on a social justice lens and we need to focus on grassroots autonomy. And then others that say, well, it's broken because the food system is causing detrimental damage to the climate. And we need to fo focus on conserving and sustainably using biodiversity, preserving natural resources, and reduce the, the, the environmental footprint of the food system on, on, on the environment. So this, again, creates different messages coming from the scientific communities based on their worldviews. And so which approach should governments take? Which one should they focus on? Which one should they prioritize? This creates a lot of confusion, disagreement, and lack of consensus. And you see this in the United Nations play out quite significantly. 
Some of that confusion also comes from mistrust about how science is funded. Nutrition in particular has come under a lot of scrutiny for receiving funding from industry. And depending on which industry player funding is coming from, that can influence the results of scientific findings. So for example, the New York Times ex exposed that a group of scientists were receiving funding from Coke to argue that the science wasn't strong, that diets and drinking sugar-sweetened beverages resulted in obesity. It was lack of exercise. Um, and this is a quote from the Coca-Cola company talking about um, they had the best of intentions to support science. Um, but obviously that didn't play out well. And there's been a recent a slew of papers looking at historic industry documents, looking at how industry tries to infiltrate certain organizations, certain academic institutions, certain scientists to relay messages that benefit uh, their products. So for example, there was a lot of controversy looking historically at sugar consumption in the United States and a downplay that sugar is bad for you and that it's actually saturated fats that were bad for, for cardiovascular disease and cancer. So there was this shift where products moved to low fat products and to make up for the taste issues, sugar was added to those products. And there was a lot of historical documents showing that industry-sponsored financial interests um, were sponsoring this messaging to promote sugar and demonize fat. And we saw this with the U.S. Dietary Guidelines. We saw the United States not giving funding to WHO to limit sugar, uh, very much influenced by the sugar industry. And this is quite perverse influence of science by industry to promote certain messages that benefit uh, the economic gains for industry as opposed to public health gains. Uh, a recent controversy is around the dietary uh, uh, restrictions on meat. The Eat Lancet uh, promoted a plant-based diet. Right after that, the Annals of Internal Medicine published a series of papers by uh, a whole group of medical doctors arguing that red meat consumption uh, linked to cardiovascular disease and cancer was very weak. Well, it turns out some of those authors on that uh, weak linkage paper were funded by the Cattlemen's Association. And then after that, uh, JAMA, this paper, um, looked closely at, at that uh, debate and found that um, some of those pushing the plant-based meat, uh, plant-based diets were funded by plant-based food industry, like the walnut industry. So both sides are being funded to, to push these certain messages out. And this creates uh, incredible mistrust in the science by not only scientists on other, on, on the sides of, 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 of the, of the argument, with governments and, and public health. Marion Nessel, professor at NYU, has been really trying to expose uh, industry-funded science, not only in funding the actual science and research, but uh, industry funding scientists to go to conferences, to receive honorariums, other incentives that um, industry tries to influence science and in different ways. And she's really been exposing that. And this is her book that just came out, The Unsavory Truth, which is a good read if, for those of you who are interested in, in, in this uh, area of, of, of conflicts of interest. But there's other conflicts of interest outside of industry funding science, food and nutrition science. It's just partnering with industry overall creates a lot of vested interest and, and mistrust in, in the whole uh, global uh, consensus and cooperation around, around nutrition and food. Um, there's mistrust of partnering with private sector, the public sector partnering with private sector um, because of tr past transgressions. We can think of Nestle, Danone pushing breast milk substitutes in the developing world uh, over uh, breast milk, which is the best for young children, 
These companies pushed breast milk substitutes. Women used uh, unclean water to mix those breast milk substitutes. And mortality of young children went up dramatically. Many of these companies are blacklisted, like Nestle, Danone, um, by nutrition uh, organizations. Um, because of these historic transgressions, but they continue to do so. This is a Save the Children report that came out in 2018 showing that breast milk substitutes are still pushed in developing and emerging markets, and they still break the code compliance, the international code on breast milk substitutes, um, basically to not do that. Um, many of these companies still break the code um, on these breast milk substitutes. And there's still mistrust of private sector because of current transgressions. We know that private sector uh, continues to produce and push these ultra processed foods, high in sugar, salts, and fats um, on the general public uh, through marketing. And we're seeing even now with COVID, many companies are pushing um, their their products on 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 uh, on people and 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 really uh, jumping on the tail of of COVID to um, push their products. Here's Domino saying, "We're hiring now. Help feed your community um, with a you know hot piping Domino's pizza picture." I was just watching an Amazon movie last night and they had commercials, and Hershey's was uh, pushing their uh, chocolate products saying in these times of COVID and social distancing, we're here with you. We're all in this together kind of approach. So um, these current transgressions of the food industry still create um, a real lack of trust um, amongst consumers. And, you know, when you see things like this, this was on Twitter, um, the CEO of Philip Morris um, said, I'm often asked why, uh, why don't we stop selling cigarettes? Perhaps this is the wrong question. The right question might be, when will people stop buying cigarettes? And, and an expert in global health responded, said it might be, but it isn't. Utterly perverted logic. And you see this a lot in the food space. Industry says, well, we sell salads at McDonald's. People just don't buy them. They don't want them. They want the French fries. But we know that there's very little incentive, very little push, very little marketing to sell salads over French fries when French fries are the defaults and happy meals, not salads, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really kind of this perverse logic of, of arguing that we're doing the best we can, but consumers just don't want it. And maybe a bit of that is true, but certainly not all of it. Um, but private sector can't be ignored. Um, they, control much of the food that is produced, moved, processed, marketed around the world. So how do we figure out a way to engage with private sector? But there's a real weariness to partner by public sector. Again, public sector consumers lack trust in the private sector. And in turn, because of that anti-business ideology and that lack of trust, private sector has no incentive to engage with the public sector. You know, if you don't trust me, why would I partner with you? So we have to ask ourselves, what's the cost of not engaging with private sector? What does that mean? Should we just ignore them? Well, that's really not possible when we think about the control and the power that private sector has across the food system. You know, and this lack of trust is perpetuated. This is a, a documentary series on Netflix called Rotten, where it shows the corruption throughout the food supply chain. Now, whether or not um, all of all of what they 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 highlight in the documentary is true, it does create this uncertainty of the food supply chain um, and this sensationalization of of how the food system is corrupt. In the private sector is is um, the bad guy. So how do we get over? How do we create trust again? And it doesn't help when there are true cases of food fraud, unsafe food adulteration. We know many products are not purely those products: honey, olive oil being adulterated. They're not purely honey and olive oil. 
that creates incredible mistrust by consumers of the product that they're getting. Um, a classic um, pro uh, issue around food fraud and unsafe food is in China in 2008 when melamine, an industrial product, was added to infant formulas to increase the protein content of those foods. Melamine is found on plastics and in ceilings and on countertops, and it killed children in South and East and Southeast Asia. And it created incredible mistrust of foods coming from China that they're still struggling with. So this melamine um, issue is real. And now we have, um, and it's highlighted with COVID, the pandemic, a zoonotic born disease that moved to the food supply, moved to wet markets. We've seen that with avian flu, SARS, Ebola, et cetera. Um, and this is a, creates a lot of mistrust in the food supply overall. And is industry and is government protecting consumers enough is the big question. So who should we trust? Well, many look to activists, journalists, cooks, and chefs, chefs, TV food stars. Many read. We can think of Jose Andres, local star. He's doing incredible stuff um, to feed uh, vulnerable populations. But you can think of Anthony Bourdain, rest in peace. And many food stars are becoming the authorities on what to eat. Journalists who've turned into uh, advocates and activists. We have Raj Patel wrote Stuffed and Starved. Jonathan Safran Foer, We Are the Weather. He's writing a lot about veganism. Tamar Haspel at Washington Post. She's very active on Twitter. People follow her a lot. Uh, Michael Pollan, who wrote Omnivore's Dilemma. Um, he wrote uh, In Defense of Food. He created the slogan, Eat Food, Not Too Much, most, Mostly Plants, which is great advice. Uh, Eric Schlosser, Fast Food Nation, Mark Bittman, Food Matters. All of these journalists have written eloquently and articulately about the food system. Um, and many people trust them over the scientists. So why are journalists having to educate us and should they be? Well, first of all, maybe scientists need to improve their communication skills, come to consensus and not create confusion. That's one thing, is to put it on the scientists. Well, but we do have to put it on some of these journalists. Many of these journalists don't have traditional training in science. They act as advocates, and they've become celebrities in their own right. But they often write about nutrition and food issues in a more ideological way, taking pieces and parcels of data to tell a really good story. Um, and And... They, they write a lot about the industrialization. They're very, you know, GMO, very anti-GMOs, pro-organic. Um, and it's less about the science and more about a belief system of what the food system should ideally look like. But it often comes off as just a food system for the elite few. So we need scientists and researchers to tell a better story. And one kind of classic example of that is climate change. For 40 years, climate scientists have been building the evidence. And they presented that evidence a long time ago to governments. And there's a great article in the New York Times called Losing Earth, The Decade We Almost Stopped Climate Change, the 1970s. And what happened was there was accumulating evidence about the impacts of human uh, footprint, the Anthropocene, on climate, and a lot of uh, data to suggest that. And the governments just didn't listen. Um, and the risk of making well-intentioned but inappropriate policy choices are much smaller than the risks of using a lack of evidence as an argument for inaction. And that's exactly what happened with climate. So how do we, as a science community, those working in development, create more convincing arguments that governments will take up to engage and, and solicit action. And that is a big issue that we have in the nutrition and food space with all the confusion and mistrust from the many different actors.